Coming up on Oregon News, find out why Governor Brown ordered a hiring freeze for state employees, and why 31 U of O faculty members are losing their positions, and how UO President Schill plans to cut even more from the budget. Also, learn how college loan debt is delaying financial security for students nationwide. In sports, the women's track team is aiming to make history with a triple crown. All of this and more on Oregon News. Welcome to Oregon News. I'm Cal Newton. And I'm Kendra Fagerberg. Here are today's top stories. The White House says a breakthrough for the Republican-backed health care bill is expected in the House next week. The new version reportedly includes a deal led by the Conservative Freedom Caucus and moderate Republicans. This would give states more room to remove provisions from the Affordable Care Act. While the President Trump calls this, quote, a great plan, some GOP lawmakers say there's, there's higher priority to focus on, such as passing a spending bill to avoid government shutdown. Unemployment has dropped to historic lows in at least four states, including Oregon. Oregon's rate is now 3.8 percent. Other states that have seen drops include Colorado, Maine, and Arkansas. Although state unemployment rates are lower, that hasn't translated into more money in tax revenue for Oregon. Governor State Governor Kate Brown has signed an executive order for freezing all hiring of new state employees. The freeze begins May 1st and will run through June 30th. The deadline for Oregon lawmakers to close the state's $1.6 billion budget shortfall is July 1st. In addition, Brown is asking state departments to cut travel budgets of a minimum of 10 percent. Oregon high school students might have to wait just a little bit longer to enroll in Woodshop. Last November, Oregon voters passed Measure 98 which requires more technical and college prep programs in high schools. It's part of an effort to increase graduation rates. But the state legislature hasn't figured out how to fund these classes. At the local level, the superintendent for Eugene 4J Schools, Dr. Gustavo Balderas, says smaller schools can't afford to implement Measure 98 without state support. We have schools that are cutting days. I just heard of a school, a local school, that may be cutting up to 11 days next year. So, you know, that's the type of school that would, that has a, a difficulty with a measure such as this. Yeah, it's great. So far, legislators have failed to establish funding for Measure 98. With that funding in limbo, Balderas is skeptical about the measure's future. The state is not the only place struggling to balance its budget. Yesterday, U of O President Schill announced another cut of $4.5 million. This decrease is in response to the university's need to close a $27.5 million budget gap. These cuts will come from 1% reduction in administrative general spending, removing the Strategic Investment Fund, ending the graduation incentive grants for at-risk students, and ending distribution of interest of operational funds. While these cuts will reduce the shortfall by half, President Schill says the university financial future still is unclear. At least 31 jobs will be cut at the University of Oregon in the next year. Chloe Spencer tells us why this is happening and how students and faculty are reacting to the news. Some familiar faces may be missing next year at the University of Oregon. According to the Register Guard, the College of Arts and Sciences will be cutting 21 non-tenure track faculty and 10 staff workers. Most of those losing their jobs will be language instructors and humanities faculty. Faculty union leaders are frustrated by the cuts. These are not just budgetary decisions, they're academic decisions that are impacting the quality uh, of our uh, program. But why are faculty being cut when tuition is increasing next year? So the university has to cut about $8.8 .8 million in spending in order to balance its annual budget. So these 31 jobs, as represented by this little diagram I drew here, will cut $1.7 million from the College of Arts and Sciences annual budget of $140 million. In a letter to the faculty, UO President Michael Schill offered other reasons for these cuts, writing, One consequence of our disproportionate reliance on NTTFs has been our underperformance in research. But Dryling argues that it is really because non-tenure track faculty are easier to let go. It's not that they're somehow less valuable to the University of Oregon. But the difference is, is in the terms of their employment contract. Student Yomaira Tarula is concerned for future students who want to take language classes. 
you know, it just scares me that these classroom sizes are going to be huge. According to Dryling, Tarula has every right to be concerned. Tenure track faculty have provided a report to the deans outlining the problems with the cuts. Those cuts would involve the loss of opportunities for about 900 seats in classes uh, in Spanish language instruction. The current student to faculty ratio is 17 to 1. Dryling points out that small class sizes can be academically beneficial for many students. United Academics members have started a card campaign and invited President Schill to meet with NTTFs. Schill replied and said that he would like to attend the meeting. I think President Schill is sincere in wanting to uh, understand uh, the role of non-tenure track faculty and the specific kind of concerns that are getting raised. Chloe Spencer, Oregon News. Up to 75 jobs at other schools may be cut as well. As Oregon struggles to balance its budget, state funding for higher education is not expected to meet the needs of the coming year. Now college tuition is going up. Oregon State and the University of Oregon has already raised their rates. A 10.6% increase for UO in state students means they'll need to take out bigger loans in order to graduate. Kate Houston reports on student debt nationwide and how it could block a secure financial future for many. Andrea Gardner is about to graduate in only three years, but she will still have more than $100,000 in student loans. To many, graduating from college in three years is an accomplishment, but Andrea says she did not have a choice. As I've had to push my school years forward by taking summer classes since they're cheaper, so it's kind of forcing me out into the real world faster than I'd like. According to the Federal Reserve, student loan borrowing has tripled in the past decade. It is now up $1.3 trillion nationwide, with the average student graduating with more than $30,000 in student loans. College has become a huge financial investment. Paying for one is much like purchasing a new home or a car. The UO's Associate Director of Financial Aid says school choices should not be based on emotion. Jennifer Bell advises students to select schools based on how much debt they can handle after graduation. They'll visit a college campus and say, oh, I love it here, this is where I'm going. And the price tag will be $50,000 and students won't bat an eye at that. With graduation right around the corner, most students are excited to leave school. But for Andrea Gardner, it is the complete opposite. I have to hurry up and get out of here and stop acquiring so much debt, but also by hurrying up and getting out, I'm sending myself straight into it. So it's sort of a lose-lose situation. Reporting for Oregon News, I'm Kate Houston. Gardner, along with thousands of other students, will start repaying their loans six months after graduation. While U.S. students like Gardner are facing a decade-high $1.7 trillion debt, what do other students around the world face when they graduate from university? Jasmine Cookson reports. In just under 60 days, thousands of UO students will be graduating and leaving their college lives behind. But, like millions of students nationwide, they will also be leaving with a huge student debt. For most college students, the average student debt is around $37,000, in total, U.S. student debt sits at $1.4 trillion. 30 million students take out direct loans to get through college. Then, they have six months until they start repaying that loan, with interest and regardless of income. Ultimately, it'll come to a point where people have got to decide, do I want to go that much into debt? Or do I want to spend as little time as possible, take a smaller debt, and then start earning? Education does have to come at a cost. But other countries and other parts of the world show that how that cost is passed on is the key to managing students' debt. In Australia, students take out a HEX loan to cover their tuition. Then, they only start paying back their loan when they meet an income threshold of $54,000. The UK is the same. Students only start paying off their loan when they start making over £17,000. And then there are some European countries who have tuition-free education mainly funded by high tax rates, like Germany, Norway and Denmark. Well, the thing is, when you hold a whole nation of young people captive through debt, is that a good idea? But until America starts changing its ways, student debt will always be a reality for its students. Jasmine Cookson, Oregon News. Thanks, Jasmine. Thirteen percent of the University of Oregon's student body are from international lands, most being from China, others hailing from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Yemen. 
Unfortunately, Yemen has been in war with itself since 2011, and one of the students from Yemen spoke to reporter Deuce Woodson about what it's like to be away from home in a time of crisis. Senior Haytham Abowadel is homesick. It's been now four years in total, almost four years. I've not seen my family back home. And he says, with the ongoing civil war in his home country, the homesickness has intensified. Your family's in danger. You know, you don't know what's going to happen to them. Ju just makes it more worse. Currently, Yemen has no government. Rebel forces control half the country, and terrorist organizations such as ISIS and Al Qaeda are operating in the state. And it looks like Yemen's struggles aren't going to be over anytime soon. According to University of Oregon senior history instructor Alexandra Jacobli, the future of the Middle East looks bleak. I'm actually skeptical that there's a solution. Uh, there's too many problems, too many divisions. Abu Adel says other Middle Eastern students share his concerns, family members becoming casualties of war while they're studying abroad. I would regret every minute and second that I've stayed here in, in the U.S., but I have no choice. Although Abu Adel worries about his family in Yemen, he says his partner and children in the U.S. keep him going. What makes me sleep at night is knowing that I have two beautiful kids, um, striving to have a good life for them. Deuce Woodson, Oregon News. According to the BBC, since March 2015, more than 7,600 people have been killed and 42,000 injured because of the Civil War. In other campus news, apparent Nazi sympathizers encountered a chilly reception when they visited the U of O yesterday on Hitler's birthday. At around noon, two men drove a truck bearing Nazi insignia around the campus. When they arrived at the Student Union building, students gathered around them. Most were clearly angry and emotional and demanded the visitors leave. Two university police officers stood by but did not interfere with either the students or the two men who soon left. Witnesses told us the men claimed they were trying to promote their documentary about the life of Hitler. In the wake of the firing of TV personality Bill O'Reilly at Fox News, the company's stock has started gaining ground. It has been down 4% this morning has recovered nearly half of that loss. The, the longtime host of The O'Reilly Factor has come under fire after revelations surfaced of sexual assault allegations and alleged payoffs of $13 million to different, five different women. In leaving Fox News, O'Reilly has received a payout of $25 million, an entire year's salary. Coming up on Oregon News, a look at student men mental health services at the U of O and find out why marijuana dispensaries are having banking trouble. All of this and more after the break. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease, no pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter, but this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. A suicide at the University of Oregon at the beginning of the spring term has once again focused attention on access to mental health care. As Bailey Mulder reports, students and faculty are accessing resources that are available on campus. University of Oregon junior Tori Hyam takes 12 credits, works 25 to 30 hours a week, and is involved in Greek life. She is a member of Tridel and vice president of risk management for the Panhellenic Council. Hyam says the stress of everyday life as well as personal issues prompted her to reach out for help. I was coping with that and I was managing that, but I realized that it was really debilitating to me and I found that these services were available, so I was like, why am I not using them? Hayam says, although she knew about the services available all along, it took her nearly three years to finally seek the resources she needed to keep herself mentally healthy. We need to be having those conversations because people are struggling and we're not getting the help and the services that we need to be successful. Her first step was making an appointment at the University Counseling Center. Counseling is offered at the health center on campus. Students can receive psychological help at the center from a professional specializing in college mental health. 
and it's free of charge. There are options of individual or group therapy, as well as outreach and referral services, but that's not the only option for students. In addition to the Counseling Center, the Duck Nest is another place where students can seek help on campus. It is staffed by peer wellness advocates who know the challenges that college students face every day. The Duck Nest is an extension of the Health Center. It provides services such as meditation, yoga, wellness workshops, and therapy dogs. And most Duck Nest services are free for students. However, direct counseling services are not offered. Peer wellness advocate Marisa Polanski says a Duck Nest is more of a referral service for students seeking help. Even just being stressed out is a, a dimension of your mental health and to seek services about mental health you don't have to be at the extreme end of the spectrum. Chaim says she is happy that she has reached out to receive the help she needs and she hopes to inspire others to do the same. The first step to getting better and the first step to happiness is accepting that your struggle is not, it is unique but you're not alone. For those students who would like to seek help but do not feel comfortable doing so in person, the Counseling Center has an after-hours hotline at 541-346-3227. Bailey Mulder, Oregon News. Signs of me mental suffering can include personality changes, moodiness, withdrawal, and engaging in risky behaviors. To help students build healthy connections in their transition to college, the UO will open a new student dorm in the fall of 2017. This follows the university's first year living requirement for future students. The dorm will house 531 students and one faculty member. For an easier transition, students will live with people based on similar majors, interests, or identity. Leah Andrews is the Marketing and Communication Director for University Housing. She thinks the new dorm will be beneficial for students. If we can find a way to connect you with other people who are really excited about the same thing, we can create a stronger experience for you here on campus. Andrews says students living on campus have a higher GPA and graduation rate. The university is working to make the cost for living on campus more affordable due to the new live on campus requirement. If you've been to a marijuana dispensary, chances are you've had to take cash out first. Mitch Reams reports on why this makes the industry risky. That's a sound many dispensary owners and customers are tired of hearing. Marijuana is still federally illegal, which means no banks, no credit cards, and a whole lot of cash. And with cash comes risk. I feel like we're a target. Everybody knows that we deal in large amounts of cash. Rachel Pond is the owner of Fresh Start, a dispensary in Springfield. She is constantly on guard while at work. I'm very, very heightened aware of even when we close shop at night, the first thing I want to do is lock our doors. But the need for security doesn't end when the doors are locked. Dispensary owners are required to take their taxes in cash to the Oregon Department of Revenue in Salem every month. If I have to go drive it to the Department of Revenue, I could be carrying over $10,000 cash on me and I don't have an armored truck. But. Armored trucks are now a more realistic and affordable option for dispensary owners. That's because MAPS Credit Union has begun to offer armored car service to people who have to transport their taxes to Salem. They offered an armored car service, so I'm going to sign up for that as soon as I can afford it. MAPS is the only credit union in Oregon still offering bank accounts to marijuana businesses, but the fees associated with such accounts are high. It's around six thousand dollars annually. I decided against it just because it's kind of a slap in the face. When it comes to banking on marijuana, everyone we talked to agreed something has to change. Reporting for Oregon News, I'm Mitch Reams. Thanks Mitch. MAPS Credit Union could not be reached for a comment on that story. While some businesses are worried about safe banking, customers may not realize that off-duty marijuana use could cost them their job and a bill protecting employees who consume cannabis failed in the Oregon legislature earlier this week. Though cannabis use is legal in the state, Oregon's at-will employment law allows termination without cause or notice. The bill would have protected both recreational and medical marijuana use, but employers have no scientific way to determine if a worker is or has been under the influence of marijuana. And a last minute attempt to revise the bill also went up in smoke. Because the bill failed, not even those with medical cards will be protected. 
In other business news, when the bottle deposit increased to 10 cents three weeks ago, recycling also increased. But that was what the bottle bill was designed to do. There's been also a negative effect that has happened as well. One of the unintended consequences of the bottle deposit increase has been reports of some people using bottle returns to abuse SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is formerly known as food stamps. According to recent reports, a portion of recipients are using SNAP benefits to purchase cases of water, only to throw out the water so they could turn in the empties for cash, which they can then use to buy non-eligible items such as alcohol and tobacco products. Ashley Stanfield uses SNAP as a crucial support for her family, and she's fed up with people taking advantage of the system. I think it's really unfair, people who are abusing food stamps, doing things like trading in bottles so that they can use the money when people like me actually want the food and need the food. This trick is not new. It's called water dumping and it's been seen for years. Sherilyn Burgess is the public relations and outreach manager for Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. She says she hopes most Oregonians will make better decisions about recycling. Ethically, that's not really the right thing to do. The Oregon Bottle Bill is intended to function with all these deposits sort of going in a loop all of the time. Authorities are treating water dumping as an offense and those caught will lose their benefits. They're wasting water, they're wasting taxpaying money, and lastly, it could go to a family or someone, a college student like me, who would actually not abuse these privileges and put them to good use. Officials say it's up to store owners in the community to report these incidents to the police to make sure that SNAP is being used for what is intended. Coming up on Oregon News, we'll catch you up on the UO softball team's struggling season and how a new coach is reinventing the football culture on campus. Stay tuned for sports after the break. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. Welcome back. I'm r r Rodian. Remember last season when Oregon baseball barely finished 500 and missed the postseason? Well, that terrible year might be in the rearview mirror. The Ducks have quietly busted out a 23-10 record, winning six of eight series played in the process. But this weekend might prove if the Ducks are for real or are still the ugly duckling in the Pac-12. Stanford, who swept the Ducks last season, comes to Eugene for a three-game series, followed by a quick old one-game road trip up to Corvallis to play the number one team in the country, Oregon State. While baseball may be on the come up, Oregon softball has been slipping over the past few weeks. After starting the season by tying the NCAA record for most straight wins to start the season, the Ducks dropped their last two series to UCLA and Washington. It doesn't get any easier for coach Mike White's team from here on out. Six of the Ducks' final 12 games are against top three teams in the country, with a series at Arizona coming up this weekend, followed by Florida State in a few weeks. Now the Ducks are locked at making the postseason, but their play over the next few weeks will likely determine if they will be chosen to host a Super Regional come May. While softball season is coming to an end, Oregon outdoor track and field season is just beginning. Last week, Oregon track caught some heat down in LA in three separate meets. While the men's team did well as usual, the women's team was the real star of the weekend. Raven Rogers broke the 27-year-old co collegiate record in the 800 meters by just a hundredth of a second. The Ducks also enjoyed a flurry of individual wins throughout the weekend. That kind of dominance might just be the beginning of history for the women's team. Lena Bond has more. Hayward Field is no stranger to greatness. Behind these gates, some of the world's most accomplished athletes have earned their titles. And now, the University of Oregon women's track and field team looks to etch their name in Hayward's prolific history. After winning both the cross country and indoor track and field titles, Oregon could be the first NCAA Division I women's team to complete a triple crown by winning the outdoor track championship. The Ducks, who are currently number one in the outdoor rankings by the U.S. Track and Field and Country Coaches Association, are heavily favored to pull it off. But redshirt sophomore sprinter and 2016 Olympian Ariana Washington said she and her team will not focus on it. I try not to put any extra pressure on myself. I try to think like it's a new season, um, you know, everyone gets better. So I just not have to step up to the plate. Um, I do plan on defending my title, so we'll see in June. 
Reporting for Oregon News, I'm Lena Bond. Up north in Portland, the Trailblazers have their hands full with the, with the reigning Western Conference champions, the Golden State Warriors. Rip City is down 2-0 in the series, losing by an average of more than 20 points per game. The Splash Brothers have been making it rain from downtown all over the Blazers, even without superstar Kevin Durant available in Game 2. Portland hopes it will get center Yusef Nurkic back for Game 3 on Saturday, after being out for the past few weeks with a leg fracture. Unless Portland finds a way to keep up with the Warriors soon, the series is likely over. No team has ever won when down three games to none in a best of seven series. With games throughout the weekend, what do those guys have in store for us, Wendy? Think wet, Armin. It is no surprise that it will be raining in most of Oregon this weekend, but there will be a small glimpse of sunshine. Here in Eugene, get ready to soak up some vitamin D today because temperatures could reach 69 degrees with sunny skies. So you may need to break out the sunscreen, but don't forget your rain jacket since the rest of the weekend will be cloudy with chances of rain on Sunday with reaching 56 degrees and a low of 46. If you're headed to Bend for the weekend, you should expect similar weather with sunshine on Friday, followed by par partly cloudy skies and rain throughout the rest of the weekend. Up north in Portland, the trend continues the trend continues with sun on Friday with a high of 70 and rain on Saturday and, su Saturday and Sunday as well. So if you're going to the Blazers game on Saturday, make sure you bundle up and bring a rain jacket because it is going to be raining buckets all night. If you're lucky enough to travel to Florence, make sure you pack a beach towel since the sun will be out and temperatures could reach 70 degrees today. But the sun won't stay for long because the rain will be back on Saturday and Sunday. California is sounding real nice this time of year, and if you're headed to Coachella or Stagecoach, make sure you soak in that sun as much as possible before heading back to the rainy state that we know. That's all I have for weather. Back to the desk. Thanks, Wendy. After the break, find out how the Eugene community is dealing with or celebrating Earth Day. Your son wants to get a cat, really but you're allergic. Do you A, prepare yourself, B, make the best of it. C squared equals... 25. Good job! Or C, find a loophole. When it comes to parenting, there are no perfect answers. But that's okay, because you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Teens in foster care will love you just the same. Speaking of impact, Earth Day is the right around the corner, and student groups are taking action. Although climate change is a controversial issue right now during the current government, and the University of Oregon Sustainability Center held week-long activities for students to partake in. Activities range from guest speakers to service events. It is not too late to join the Celebrating of Earth since the day of service starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. with multiple projects to choose from locally. The Student, the student Sustainability Center wants to celebrate the Earth and focus on creating a more sustainable future. Thank you for joining us today on Oregon News. I'm Cal Newton. And I'm Kendra Fagerberg. We'll see you next week.